In 2014, Russian mountaineer Leila Elbogacheva disappeared on the slopes of Mount Elbrus. She was famous all across Russia. Such brave women climbers are truly unique. That day, Elbogacheva intended to set a world record to climb Elbrus using a new route which she had devised herself and while on the summit to record a video with an anti-war message. She knew Elbrus like the back of her hand, having already climbed it 12 times. The 13th climb turned out to be her last, and her call to peace never reached the intended ears. On this channel, we talk quite often about Elbrus, the 5,642 meter tall peak in the Caucasus. It's no wonder that it makes the news that much. It claims 15 to 20 lives every year. Climbing incidents make up 80% of all injury-causing accidents in the whole area around Elbrus. The rescue service has their work cut out for them. A lot of things can lead to a mountaineer's death. Unstable weather conditions, poor training, ice cascades, or falling into a crevasse. When setting out for the mountains, every climber keeps in mind the possibility that they might never return. Mountains are always a risk, no matter how well prepared you are. Even professional mountaineers and climbing instructors often die on the slopes of the Caucasian Strato Volcano. Sometimes Elbrus takes the lives of entire groups. Some of the dead are never found, or their bodies are only discovered decades later. Elbrus is also the site of frequent disappearances of so-called wild tourists, people who hike alone without informing anyone of their route. Such people usually fall victim to their own lack of experience. The most popular route to Elbrus's summit runs along the southern slope. It is considered to be relatively easy, at least in comparison to other routes. After all, we're talking about the highest peak in Europe, if the border between Asia and Europe is defined by the Greater Caucasus watershed. This route starts at the Bochki base camp at 3,720 meters, where the cable car line ends. Elbrus has two peaks, and groups need to choose which one they will climb. Either choice has its pros and cons, and the decision usually depends on the weather conditions. The whole slope is covered with glaciers that feed the main rivers of the Caucasus. Crossing the glaciers is a challenge, since there is always a risk of falling through an ice crevasse, especially if visibility is severely reduced due to bad weather. Even during the climbing season, Elbrus often has snowstorms, low temperatures and fog. In such cases, it is best to set up camp and wait till the elements subside, as it is impossible to escape or fight them. Leila Elbogacheva, the protagonist of today's story, was born in 1968 in Ingushetia, currently a region in the south of Russia. At the time, it was part of the Chechen and Gush Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. To this day, the majority of the region's inhabitants are ethnically Ingush. Most ethnic Russians left the republic in the late 90s, during the war in neighboring Chechnya. At the same time, many Chechens moved to Ingushetia to escape the conflict. Most people in Ingushetia, as well as in Chechnya and other Caucasian republics, are Sunni Muslims. Leila was also a Muslim, and she genuinely loved her religion, claiming it helped her to achieve success. Indeed, she had a lot to be proud of. Many male climbers could envy her mountaineering accomplishments. Leila was born in the small village of Aliyur, not far from Magas, the capital of Ingushetia. She grew up in a large family where she was the eighth and youngest child. From an early age, she was very sporty. Leila lost her father when she was only two years old, and her mother, Maryam, brought the children up on her own. The woman wanted to make sure that her children did not want for anything and received a good education. Leila loved eating sweets the most. Her mother recalled. She didn't share sweets with anyone. Layla first showed her tough character in primary school, insisting that she participate in sports events together with the boys, much to the surprise of her teachers. Her class often won competitions thanks to her. At school, Layla was almost a straight A student, only getting a B in algebra, geometry, and physics. After getting a philology degree from Chichen Ingush State University in 1991, 
Layla returned to her hometown and started teaching Russian language and literature at the school she herself had once graduated from. Both colleagues and students loved Layla and still have warm recollections of her. Here's how the school's head teacher speaks of her. She was born to be a teacher. She was competent, had all the skills and knowledge. The children loved her. I have never been in the habit of raising my voice at the students. I never registered their Fs, but if they got an F, they would have to come to me after class to recite the topic." Albogachiva herself recalled. Before the age of 30, Albogachiva had only ever dreamed of the peaks of Ingushetia, until one day during a school trip to the Elbrus Mountains when Layla decided to make her dream come true. After all, the mountains had beckoned her since early childhood. I first went to the mountains in 1998. I joined a Karachaya expedition that was taking horses up Elbrus. I met some wonderful people there. They were mountaineers who had the title of Master of Sports. One of them became my coach and urged me to develop mountaineering in Ingushetia. So that's what I'm doing. When I was little, I used to look at the peaks and think, will I never get there? Will I just have to look at them? I was four years old and I didn't even know what mountaineering was, but I already had the desire for it. Some describe mountaineering as a drug that you get hooked on the first time and can never give up. This is what happened to Layla. After her first trip, she fell in love with the mountains and wanted to go there time and again. She began to study with an instructor and slowly built up her mountaineering experience, all the while looking for funding for her next adventures. Mountaineering is quite expensive. The climbers need equipment, plane and train tickets to the foot of the mountains, food and accommodation. It was not easy for a rural teacher to save up this kind of money. In 2010, after a short break, Layla returned to the mountains and made three difficult ascents of Elbrus. Then, she turned her attention to higher peaks. In 2012, she had a major breakthrough. Thanks to her persistence and strenuous training, Layla was able to join the Ingushetia on Top project, time to coincide with the 20th anniversary of the Republic. Participants had to climb Aconcagua in South America, Kilimanjaro in Africa, and then go on to Everest. Layla was the only woman in the group who conquered all three peaks. The team included such outstanding mountaineers as Vladimir Korenkov, who had already been to Everest twice, and Asnar Hajiev, who had climbed Elbrus a whopping 44 times. They referred to Layla as that English woman, as if thinking she was incapable of sporting feats. But there was nobody like Layla in Ingushetia. Layla joined our expedition. There were seven of us, four Ingush and three people of other nationalities. Layla proved herself to be a great human being, an outstanding mountaineer, and a woman that some man should look up to, says Visan Yusupov, president of the Ingushetia Mountaineering Federation. Layla conquered Everest. But climbing the highest peak of the planet once was not enough for her. In 2013, she ascended Everest for the second time, becoming the only Russian woman who had climbed it twice, both from the north and the south face. I went there so that we could say that Everest is ours. Now I have climbed to the summit from both the north and the south, from Tibet and Nepal. What for? Many people don't get it. The cliffs, the permafrost, the constantly looming risk of death, but I cannot give up the view that opens up when you climb to the top. At the summit, Layla first prayed and then had her picture taken with the flags. She spent 35 minutes on the Earth's highest peak, the maximum time anyone should stay at that altitude. As you can see, her faith was very important to her. I ascended the peak and I didn't even feel the pride in having done it. I was only proud that Allah had given me strength to stand on that peak, that I managed this thanks to him. As Layla was descending, her friend Russian climber Alexei Balatov, who had set out to the summit despite the bad weather, tragically died. Unfortunately, death on Everest is always just around the corner. Layla herself nearly died while crossing one of Everest's most dangerous sections, the part from 6,500 to 7,000 meters, which is prone to constant rockfalls. I had nearly reached the camp when a stone hit me in the head. I didn't understand anything at first. I only managed to scream, 
God, what's that? I saw that my head and mask were covered in blood. I reached the camp at 8300 and fell asleep at this altitude without oxygen. In the morning I woke up and wondered, had I really been hit so hard on the head that I had slept here all this time? After the blow I couldn't remember how I reached the camp. Layla was shocked by how Sherpas and other climbers behaved on Everest, leaving their weaker teammates to die on its slopes. She did not like for the rule that only the strongest survived Everest. In Ingushetia, everyone was used to helping each other and never leaving a friend in distress. Layla herself was both strong-willed and empathetic, dreaming of feeding all the world's hungry people and helping those in need. Her boldest dream, which she constantly voiced in her home village, was to build a good sports center that both boys and girls could attend. In Muslim republics such as Ingushetia, girls are often excluded and separated from boys who are allowed much more, such as playing active games and doing sports. In the meantime, girls are taught domestic chores. Layla wanted to change that. At one press conference, I said that we should remove rubbish and other things from mountains. I didn't specify what the other things were at the time, but I'll say it now. Corpses. I heard about a Japanese woman who had suffered for three days there before dying. I'd be unable to ignore something like that. I would have given away my oxygen. But nobody stopped for her. Sherpas died there. One had fallen into a crevasse. A Chinese man died when I was there. They just wrapped him in a tent and left him there. The guides take the dead people's belongings. At the time, Everest was nearing the peak of its popularity. A few years ago, it witnessed a huge traffic jam of climbers approaching the summit, and it seemed as if anyone could reach the planet's highest point as long as they had enough money. Of course, money cannot guarantee that such a trip will go well, especially for unprepared hikers. A full decade earlier, Layla already knew that commercializing tracks to Everest would lead to no good. The mountain is now littered with rubbish, empty oxygen tanks and corpses. The question of how to deal with this problem is more relevant than ever. But let's go back to our story. During the ascent to Everest, Layla had strange dreams that stayed with her for many years. She spoke about them in an interview after the climb. I often have prophetic dreams in the mountains. On Everest, I dreamt that I was in a concentration camp, about to be sent to the gas chambers. Suddenly Hitler comes in and says to me, this is not the time for you, you have to cooperate with us. On this day, the first Sherpa died. They found him at 7000, and two days later, a Sherpa in another group died. For some reason, I dreamt of Leonid Brezhnev and Yuri Gagarin. Brezhnev was giving me a tour of the Kremlin. That time, despite all hardship, Leila returned home safely. In between tracks, Layla dedicated herself to her beloved students in Ali Yurt and occasionally took part in various sporting events such as the Olympic torch relay in Ingushetia. In her home republic, Albuga Chiva was considered a true hero, an ordinary teacher from a small village who conquered Mount Everest twice. For her first ascent, she was rewarded with the Toyota car and a huge bouquet of flowers. Layla even met the president of Ingushetia. Her home village of Ali Yurt was immensely proud of her, seeing her as a local legend. It is quite important to point out that Layla succeeded in somewhat changing the conservative views of Ingushetia's population about what a woman should and should not do. This happened even despite incidents when fellow climbers assigned her laundry, cooking and emotional care without thinking twice. It is true, some thought she didn't belong in the mountains and even tried to discourage her from ascending Everest a second time. But despite the evil tongues, Layla persevered and reached new heights. She said herself that she was motivated by her faith in Allah and the power of courage. At each summit, she recorded a video message to her friends and family, and most importantly to her mom, who was waiting for Layla to come home. In 2014, the 46-year-old Albagachiva went to Elbrus on her own, only formally joining a group of other climbers. Its death zone is further away while human settlements are closer. Nothing to worry about, right? It was September, the end of the climbing season, and the weather was quite predictable. Layla intended to set a world record by climbing the twin summit using a novel route of exceptional difficulty, which she herself had devised. Layla filmed her whole way and wished to dedicate this ascent to world peace. 
She made it to the top and recorded her usual video message. However, on the way down, the weather turned sour. It began snowing and the temperature dropped first to minus 25 degrees Celsius, and then to minus 30 and even minus 40. According to her route plan, Layla was supposed to be descending along the northern slope, a journey for which she was well prepared. But on September 17th, all communication with her was cut off. The search for her only started on September 21st, after it became clear that Layla had not returned to the village of Terskal by the appointed time. A woman named Olga, who was guiding another group and had earlier seen Albogacheva on the peak, called the rescue service. At that time, another group who had wanted to reach Elbrus before the end of the climbing season was descending from the peak. At 5200 meters, they came across Layla's personal belongings. Her warm overalls, camera, and backpack were found lying on the rocks on the opposite, more difficult slope, further away from the route she had planned. It seems that Layla most likely lost her way during the descent and reached an area with a lot of crevasses, chasms, and cracks. Crossing the eastern slope requires a rope team and special ice equipment. Layla was alone and had only her poles. 124 people and 28 vehicles were involved in the search for Layla. However, because of the poor weather, the search parties had to move slowly and couldn't check all the possible places where Layla could have disappeared to. To make things even worse, it was snowing heavily, covering tracks and any other signs of human presence on the slope. The situation is unclear, we don't know who called the rescue service saying that the climber did not return from the ascent on time, and there is no information about her alleged whereabouts. The search was conducted at 52 to 5400 meters above sea level, and now the work has been suspended due to deteriorating weather. A spokesperson for the Russian Emergencies Ministry said on September 24th. The bad weather made it impossible to use a helicopter. A private company attempted to survey the area, but had to constantly ground the helicopter because of weather-related dangers. Bagodin Ismailov, Layla's cousin, never gave up hope that she would be found alive. She was always courageous and never lost her way in the mountains. She's very experienced. She has climbed Everest twice. I hope she will be rescued. However, since Layla had been tracking on her own, it was hard to figure out her exact route. When people move in groups, they usually have everything marked on maps, or at least one of them can roughly point out where a teammate has gone. Whereas in Layla's case, there was a lot of room for a mistake. Layla had climbed Elbrus on her own before, even in bad weather that had once forced her to spend five days near the summit. But this time, the situation was much worse. She was last seen on September 17th at an altitude of 5,300 meters on the mountain saddle, rescuer Boris Tilov said. At that time, it was already snowing heavily, and the wind reached speeds of up to 65 meters per second. Climbers fell nearly half a meter into the snow. Beyond the saddle, there is a vast zone filled with crevasses and ice chutes. If a person falls into a crevasse, we rarely find them. And the snow and wind covered the tracks. Layla is a good climber, but Albrus does not forgive mistakes. People should not go into the mountains alone. It's dangerous. Hypoxia, it is difficult to survive in such conditions for a long time, but there is hope. We found people alive after eight days. With each day, the glimmer of hope faded more and more. After the rescuers found Layla's overalls, they knew that she would not last long in the cold without her things. At such temperatures, hypothermia can occur within minutes, leading to internal organ failure and eventual death. She took a very difficult route. We fear that she got lost and took a wrong turn. Climbers from Nizhny Novgorod accidentally stumbled upon her belongings and they were found in the opposite direction from the planned route. She may have slipped and fallen into the gorge, Ingushetia's deputy sports minister said. The search had to be interrupted several times due to heavy snow and poor visibility. On October 3rd, the rescue effort was stopped for good. Layla was now considered, as many others before her, to have perished on the slopes of Elbrus.
Shortly after the official statement, a group of rescuers who were returning to their camp noticed a splotch of color at 5200 meters, only a few hundred yards from where Alelo's belongings had been found earlier. They came closer. In a deep crevasse next to some sharp rocks lay the body of a woman slightly covered in snow. The previous evening, a strong wind had picked up and blown away the top layer of snow, finally revealing what was hidden underneath. It was Layla. Apparently she had slipped during the snowstorm and fallen into a crevasse. Her boots lost traction as she was trying to retrieve her sleeping bag, which had fallen down the slope. A sleeping bag is crucial for a mountaineer, so she tried her best to save such an important item to stay warm at night. At the bottom of the crevasse, death came quickly to her. Layla died of injuries and hypothermia. Layla's body was taken down from the mountain and handed over to her family in Ali Yurt. Her mother, who always worried for Layla the most, did not give up hope until the last moment. Yet now she had to prepare the funeral of her beloved daughter. Mountaineers, friends, and family from all over Ingushetia came to say farewell. Layla's amazing life, which was cut short so tragically, had touched the hearts of many. How could this have happened? How could such an experienced mountaineer lose her way and fall? Why did she decide to climb on her own? Did Layla overestimate her strength and knowledge of Alpurus? And why did she leave all her belongings on the rocks? She wanted to set a world record by doing a so-called double cross, but heavy snowfall and strong winds prevented her from making her dream come true, says Evgeny Kurtin, a guide who had climbed Elbrus with Layla several times. My impression is that she decided to rest, perhaps relieve herself, so she took off her overalls. She most likely slept. It's a very steep and icy slope, and there's a nearly 200 meter long vertical wall right next to the crater. In Layla's belongings, the rescuers found a note with a peace message that she recorded on the summit and her camera with footage of the ascent. They also found portraits of the heads of state that Layla mentioned in her appeal. In 2014, war was raging in Syria, and Russia had occupied Crimea and invaded eastern Ukraine. Layla felt it was her duty to speak up and call for peace. After all, in the 90s, she lived next to the Chechen Republic, which was suffering from an armed conflict, and she knew firsthand the horrors that it entailed. Her new climbing record was supposed to help spread her voice around the world. She hoped to be heard in mountaineering communities worldwide, on TV and on the radio. On behalf of all people of the planet Earth who long for peace, we call on the leaders of all countries and peoples, on all of those in power, not only on those whose portraits we take to the top of Mount Elbrus, to do their best to stop wars on our planet. Men, women and children are dying in Ukraine. Thousands of children have been orphaned. It is impossible to stay indifferent. War events are happening in Syria, Israel and Iran. It is time for universal peace. War must be outlawed. All issues should be resolved solely by negotiation. This is what civilians worldwide have been praying and striving for. Down with war. Long live peace. And although in this message we see a call for peace, we cannot help but notice the discrepancy between her words and the portrait she was carrying to the top. It seems that even after Russia's annexation of Crimea, she continued supporting President Vladimir Putin and spreading her supposedly anti-war message while holding his portrait. Even though in this sense, Leila might have fallen prey to propaganda which used her achievements to justify the actions of the Russian government, I still wanted to share the story about this controversial figure in Russian mountaineering. Layla knew how deadly Elbrus was and even once spoke about it in an interview. Statistically speaking, Elbrus is the deadliest peak with 47 deaths a year. Nowhere else have so many deaths been recorded. Not even Everest. Layla's death deeply affected her home region. Ingushetia had lost its first and only female mountaineer. Yanuzbek Yevkurov, the president of Ingushetia, wrote of Layla the following. She climbed Everest twice, conquered Elbrus 12 times, and the 13th ascent was fatal for her. We will remember Layla as a bright, kind, and strong-willed person who sincerely loved Ingushetia. 
On October 5, 2014, the whole of Ingushetia mourned Leila Albukachiva's death. She was buried in her home village of Aliyurt in a small rural cemetery. Later, a sports center was named after her, the very one she had once dreamed of. A small monument in memory of Leila was erected on Elbrus. I never talk about conquering a mountain. I believe that mountains accept me and I love them in return. It is impossible to conquer them. They have stood and will continue to stand. I talk to them when I arrive. I say, hello my friend Everest, Elbrus sends his greetings. Leila used to say. Leila Elbogacheva never married or had children, which is very rare for women from Ingushetia. But she lived a vivid and rich life filled with adventures, friends, and most importantly, mountains. She left an indelible mark on the lives of ordinary people in Ingushetia and all across Russia. If you enjoyed this video, press the like button and share it with your friends. Thank you for subscribing and I promise to post videos more often. And as always, stay safe.